Well, everyone, uh, thank you so much for, for coming to our session. Uh, you know, it's the last session of the day, so hope you've had a great KubeCon so far. Uh, my name is David Porter. Uh, I'm a software engineer on the Google Kubernetes uh, team. Uh, I focus on Node. Uh, I work in upstream SIG Node community. And I'm also the maintainer of C-Advisor, which we'll talk about in this presentation, which is a monitoring uh, library used in the Kubernetes ecosystem. Hey everyone, my name is Peter Hunt. I'm a senior software engineer at Red Hat, primarily working on the container runtime cryo, but I also work in upstream SIG node and on uh, Podman and RunC and other container-related technologies. Today we're going to talk about making sense of your vital signals, the future of pod and container monitoring. So let me start this presentation with, I hope, a situation you haven't been during KubeCon, but for anyone who's been on call, it's probably faced. You suddenly get paged, right? And maybe you get paged and you have an alert. You know, maybe it's your chatbot application or your other LLM thing, and it says that the latency of your application is too high, right? What just happened and what do you do? Well, first thing, you probably ack it, right? But then after that, you figure out how do we actually resolve this? And that's what we hope to describe in this presentation. So what is kind of the monitoring observability space and why is it important? So observability, it's really important to understand how your applications are performing, right? You want to understand if you roll out new versions of your application, how is the resource changes changing, is there kind of a regression in your application, is it using too much resources, too little, et cetera, right? So you want to be able to identify issues and unexpected behavior with your apps. And maybe you also want to alert them, right? So we alerted, for example, on our latency and we got that alert, or maybe you want to alert on other scenarios like using too much memory or something like that. Additionally, maybe you have SLOs or SLIs for your internal customers or external customers, and you need observability to understand if you're adhering to those SLOs or SLIs. And lastly, not just for, for kind of you as the you know, cluster admin or, or application developer, but also the internal Kubernetes components also need monitoring and uh, metric data to perform its core functions. So a good example here, Kubelet, which is the worker agent running on every single node in your cluster, it needs monitoring data to, to be able to uh, evict pods and understand, for example, which pod is consuming too much resources. Another example here, you know, if you set up an ephemeral storage limit on your pod, and you, uh, Kubelet needs to know how much storage is your pod actually using, because if you go over the storage limit, you know, your op application will be evicted. So we need monitoring data. You need it to be able to understand how your app is doing. Your customers need it to ensure that you know, your SLOs and SLIs are met, and also the core Kubernetes components also need it to perform its core functions. So when we talk about monitoring and, and observability, there's a lot of stuff in the Kubernetes ecosystem around this. And so we want to keep this presentation kind of scoped, uh, but I want to give you a quick overview around what's, what's there in the ecosystem. So the first thing is node level metrics. There's an open source project that's quite popular, the Prometheus Node Exporter. It, its job is basically to collect node level metrics around how your actual node is doing. So this is things like how much CPU is my node using, how much memory, things like that. The next category is Kubernetes components. So each of the core Kubernetes components export metrics around how they're doing. So an example here is like the Kubelet exports metrics around, for example, the latency to start a pod. Uh, the last, the, the second, the second to last category here is metrics around your API resources. So there's some open source projects like KubeState Metrics, which generate metrics based on the API resource, or resource objects. So an example here is you know, how many pods are in this namespace. Maybe you want a metric for that. And then the last category of metrics, and this is going to be what we're going to focus on during our presentation, is pod and container workload metrics. So this is actually around the actual uh, pods and containers that are deployed on the node. How are they performing? And I would argue this is one of the most important pieces of metrics because this actually impacts your end applications and your, and your customers who are using your app. So where do these metrics come from, and how do they start? So I, to, to, to explain that, I need to introduce you to C-Advisor. And C-Advisor had a very humble beginning. Uh, this is a blog post from 2014, quite a while ago. And this is on the Google Cloud Platform blog. And this is actually the first time Kubernetes was announced. So you can see here, you know, Kubernetes announced here. It's like a cluster orchestrator back in 2014. And side by side, on the same day that Kubernetes was announced, C-Advisor was announced. And C-Advisor's job here, as it's described on the blog post, is a tool that enables fine-grained statistics and resource usage for containers. So at this time, you know, this is to set the landscape. This is just when the containers were taking off, right? People were used to like VMs and, and kind of node level uh, applications, not containerized workloads. And at that time, Google had a lot of experience running containers in production. And so when Google uh, announced uh, Kubernetes, it also realized, you know, the most important thing is going to be able to monitor and observe your workloads. And that's where C Advisor came in. So C Advisor's job was to basically get, get monitoring data for all the containers that are running. So what is C-Advisor in a little bit more detail, and how does it work? So C-Advisor, it's an open source project. 
Uh, its goal is to provide observability for all the containerized workloads that are running. How does it do that? It has built-in drivers for all the major container runtimes. This is things like Docker, Containerd, Cryo. Once it starts, it understands and talks to the driver to understand what containers are running on the system. And then it collects metrics around all those containers and exports them in a variety of different formats. To do that, it actually uses a library called libcontainer from the runc project to actually go ahead and scrape uh, that metric data. And we'll go into a little bit more detail about how that works. The other thing to call out here is C-Advisor can be used in two modes, standalone mode and library mode. So standalone mode is how you can run C-Advisor as on a single Linux box. So this might be useful, for example, you know, even outside Kubernetes if you're just running some Docker containers on a single VM and you want to monitor them. Uh, but library mode is a little bit more interesting, and library mode basically allows you to integrate C-Advisor into your Go application and provide monitoring uh, for all the containers that are running from your Go app. And the most important thing to call out here is Kubelet, which is you know, the worker node agent, actually does this and links against C-Advisor as a library. So this means whether you know it or not, every single node out there that's running Kubernetes that runs Kubelet is using C-Advisor to provide monitoring data already. So what type of metrics are we actually talking about when we talk about C-Advisor and kind of these workload level metrics? There's a huge list on, on the documentation here around the workload metrics, too long to list here. But some example here is like, you know, for example, how much CPU time my app is using, how much file system storage is it using, memory, network, all types of things are exported here, and there's a lot of metrics to go through. So where do these workloads metrics come from? We talked about that they come from C-Advisor, but where does C-Advisor get them from? And this is where we need to introduce C-Groups. So C-Groups are the core Linux kernel functionality that provide resource accounting and monitoring for containers. So every single pod becomes a C-Group and every single container becomes a C-Group. And there's two main goals of C-Groups. One is to group a set of processes together, so that's what basically forms a container, and then also be able to restrict uh, certain uh, usage for, for different kind of resource types. So, for example, you know, when you set CPU limits and memory limits, C groups are used to actually limit and enforce those things. But not only to limit them, it also exports monitoring data about that. So that allows you basically drill down to a container level and say how much resources is this container using or how much resources is this pod using. You can see it on different levels of granularity. And so, uh, with cgroups, there's a new cgroup v2 interface, um, and I did a KubeCon talk last KubeCon about it if you're more interested in, in details about that, but this forms the basis of where these workload metrics come from. So I'm going to hand it off to Peter to talk a little bit more about what does it look like for a metric and where does it come from. So I'd like you all to imagine that I am a humble metric on your Linux node. I'm, you know, uh, CPU usage or something like that, and uh, I want, I'm going to talk out how, you know, I uh, go from the kernel to, you know, you as the uh, cluster admin being able to see, you know, what my value is. So I'm the C group value. The C group FS uh, is exposed by the kernel, and it shows it's basically just a file like everything else in Unix. And it is, uh, you know, the kernel keeps it up to date with the, uh, all of the processes within that C group. Uh, libc, uh, run C's lib container is a library that uh, is used by both run C the binary as well as uh, C advisor to actually be able to read those values from the C group FS. It's just reading, opening a file and reading it. And C advisor calls into lib container to read the C group value. C advisor actually is watching all of the C groups being created on the node and for all of the ones that it knows how to read, uh, you know, uh, either, you know, the three container managers that we talked about, Docker, Containerd, or Cryo, it has special handlers to be able to talk to them a little bit to be able to figure out exactly how to interface with those containers, as well as it has a raw C group uh, driver to be able to read, you know, C groups on the host. C Advisor will then put those metrics to do different places, uh, which I'll talk about a little bit in a moment. Uh, so this is kind of the overarching picture of how I'm C group value. Uh, and I'm transmitted to you. I can also show a more concrete example. So I'm CPU usage, which we're going to talk about a little bit more in a bit. So that comes from the C group path, SysFS C group. And then there's quite a bit uh, in between there, you know, for the specific container. It goes like, you know, if in uh, burstable, and then, you know, uh, it goes all the way down to usage, use, uh, the CPU.stat file. And within the CPU.stat file, there's a uh, field usage u second, that's actually, you know, the usage per microsecond, and that's exposed, uh, you know, there. Lib container reads that and stores it in its structure, CPU stats, CPU usage, told usage, and it does that when uh, C advisor calls into it and gathers that value. C advisor then translates that into its own C group structure uh, and stores that in the usage.total. And then it writes to uh, the metric container CPU system seconds total, 
directly as well as transmits that to the qubit um, and the qubit will then store that and emit it. So how are you, know, are you able to actually see the values of the C group? The most common way that a cluster admin is going to be able to do that is through the metric C advisor endpoint or usually directly through Prometheus. So Prometheus gets it from the metric C advisor endpoint. That endpoint is uh, proxied through the qubit. So even though C advisor is directly writing to that endpoint, uh, the qubit is proxying that endpoint through its own proxy. So you can actually uh, get it directly, you know, if you're using qproxy or something, you know, this kind work. And so this is how you would do it if you're running a node called kind worker as you would with kind. Uh, and, you know, you'd uh, hit that endpoint directly and you'd be able to read a whole list of uh, metrics that uh, C advisor is emitting. Uh, Kubelet also then takes the, uh, when it requests those uh, metrics from C advisor, it also translates some of them and writes them to a JSON endpoint that's called stat summary. And this is the endpoint that actually eventually gets translated into another endpoint called metrics resource. And this is what the metric server uses uh, to emit that to the eviction manager. And that's how a eviction manager knows what the uh, status of the eviction, uh, you know, which uh, pod should be evicted on a node when you know it's using too much CPU or memory. The qubit also depends on C advisor to ga gather node level metrics, so we call those machine metrics, and it, uh, C advisor does that by you know reading the raw C groups value of the host level C groups, and that's how we know what the capacity of the node is, as well as how much is being used, uh, which will inform you know uh, also will inform the eviction manager. So next up, we're going to talk about a case study on like actually what one might do to uh, read the CPU usage and how you might you know edit your cluster's behavior based on that. So so to go back, you know we started the presentation with getting that that page. So how would you debug it? How would you investigate and understand what's going on? So we got that alert. Uh, what do we do? So the first thing uh, is. That's helpful here, and, and just in general, when we when we investigate an issue like this, is to have a strategy because if we're just blindly looking at different things, you know, we can we might kind of run out of ideas or, or just try different things and not have a strategy. So, one of the strategies here that we might use is something called the use method. Uh, this is introduced by Brendan Gregg, who's kind of a performance guru, and the the main idea behind the strategy is we look at all the different resources in our system and kind of you uh, analyze the utilization, saturation, and errors, and I'll explain what those are. So. When we talk about containerized workloads, what type of resources do we care about? There might be quite a few with you know, more and more devices these days, but the core ones that are always there are CPU, memory, I.O., and storage. So basically, we enumerate each resource, and then we look at these different characteristics. So the first characteristic is utilization. Utilization is the average time that the resource was being used uh, to do something useful. So how much CPU time was actually used by my application? The next one is satur saturation. So saturation basically tells us how much uh, extra work we wanted to do with that resource, but we weren't able to because that, that resource was busy. So for CPU, for example, if you set a CPU limit, you know, that'll, be, that'll enforce uh, saturation, and you might hit some wall there right? that we want to investigate. And then the last uh, category here is errors. Not all the resources have errors, but some might. So for example, with storage, you, know, you might have an issue uh, with actual disk, and you want to investigate uh, some errors there. right? For CPU and memory, it's less likely we'll have errors. So here's our, our uh, kube chatbot that we got alerted on. Here's the manifest. Uh, I wanted to make sure it's a guaranteed pod, so I set request equals limits. And I gave it two CPUs, because you know, that's how much I thought I needed. So, what does that actually mean when we set two CPUs as requests and limits? What does that actually do underneath? So it's helpful to understand that to understand how that actually works so that we can understand what metrics we want to investigate. So how do CPU requests and limits work? Let's do a quick deep dive into that. So CPU requests, the way to understand them, they're the minimum floor for CPU, right? When you specify a CPU request, Kubernetes doesn't overcommit on CPU the scheduler will always ensure there is that CPU available on the system. So you can always guarantee, even if the system is contended, you'll always be guaranteed to get your CPU request. CPU limit, on the other hand, it's the ceiling for CPU. So if you set a CPU limit, even if there's spare capacity, you'll get throttled. So as soon as you hit that CPU limit, you'll get throttled and won't be able to use more CPU. So these are, these are what it is from the Kubernetes pod perspective, but how is it actually implemented and what does it do underneath? So for CPU requests, uh, we actually use a Linux feature called CPU shares. Uh, the way they work here is it's basically a proportion-based system where one C group, one pod, one container might have a certain amount of CPU shares, another one has maybe double the CPU shares, and we kind of calculate a ratio between all the different C groups, and the ones that have uh, higher shares are prioritized higher and have more uh, CPU time. That's for CPU requests. 
Uh, for CPU limits, there's something called CFS bandwidth control. So how does that work? Uh, there's two key pieces of information there. One is CPU quota. That's basically how much CPU time you can use within a given time slice. And then the second characteristic there is CPU period, which defines how long that time slice is. And that's usually defaults to 100 milliseconds. So I think this is better explained with, it, with a picture. So let's take a quick look. So with CPU limits, I, I uh, have a little example here. My, I have an app, let's say, that just needs one CPU worth of work, right? So it has one CPU worth of uh, compute that it needs to perform. As a result, I, I know that up front. I'm going to set my CPU request and limit to one CPU. I have my CPU period, my time slice, which is 100 milliseconds. It's going to run. Everything's going to be happy. Everything's great. But now let's imagine we introduce a CPU limit. So we set a CPU limit here just as a sake of example for 400 millicores, right? So 40% of, of one CPU. So what's going to happen? How long is it going to take? So first, this first CPU period starts. It's 100 milliseconds. And our app is going to actually run for 40 milliseconds. It's going to run for 40 milliseconds because that's how much quota we have available because we set it to 400 uh, millicores as our limit. But then after 40 milliseconds, our CPU quota is up. We can't run anymore, and we're going to get throttled. So for the remainder of that period, that 60 milliseconds, we're going to be throttled. But we're not done yet, right? We only actually were able to use 40 milliseconds of CPU time. So another period is going to start, another 100 milliseconds. You're going to get that quota again, and then you're going to run for another 40 milliseconds. And then you're going to be blocked again uh, because we, we used up all the quota in the period. So then another period is going to start. And then finally, we're going to be able to run for 20 milliseconds. And at this point, you know, we run for 40 plus 40 plus 20 milliseconds, which is equivalent to 100 milliseconds. And now we've done our one worth of CPU work. But it took us three periods to actually do that, right? So it took us 100 milliseconds plus 100 milliseconds plus 20 milliseconds. So 220 milliseconds to do this work. When originally, when, when we had no throttling, it just took us 100 milliseconds. So this is why when you set CPU limits, it's important to really understand if, if they're having some type of disadvantage or if you're getting throttled. So how might we investigate this going back to our alert, right? That's where uh, all the workload metrics come into picture. So first, let's start with CPU utilization to understand how much CPU our application's using. Here's the metric that's coming uh, from C-Advisor, container CPU usage seconds total. It's a Prometheus metric. And I installed, actually, a, a open source project called the Coop Prometheus stack. It sets up, it's really nice, it sets up all of the Prometheus rules, it sets up all the nice Grafana dashboards, and everything kind of just works out of the box, and it's using those metrics. So here's the dashboard that comes baked in in, in Grafana. Uh, I can see here uh, my CPU request and limit is two, and you know it's definitely CPU bound. It's, 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 it's running quite a bit on the CPU, but I don't know if this is like an issue or not, right? It's running around 1.5 to two CPUs, so it's definitely CPU busy, but is it actually saturated? Is it hitting some wall? And because I set a CPU limit, I need to investigate throttling. So how might I do that? There's two other metrics you want to consider for throttling, CFS periods total and throttle periods total. So just like we were talking about before, you want to understand how many periods your application ran and how many of those periods in which it ran, it actually got throttled. And using those two metrics, you can create an aggregated metric, kind of throttle percentage, which basically is just how many periods uh, did you run total and then how many of those periods were you throttled, right? Throttled periods over total periods. And so that's what this built-in uh, dashboard uh, shows the CPU throttling percentage. And you can see it's quite high. It's over 50%, right? So 50 to 75% of the time, I'm getting throttled. So this tells me very clearly I'm hitting my CPU limit, and that's preventing uh, my application from using more CPU. And CPU is definitely saturated and, and kind of the, the issue here. So how do we solve this? Well, the simple answer, just increase the CPU limit, right? Once you increase the CPU limit, everything will be great. And uh, you know, your application will not be throttled anymore. So the main thing to take away here is workload metrics really helped us understand how our application is performing and helped us fix our and debugger issue. So uh, that's kind of the workload metrics today. And we, we're doing some work in the space. So I want to hand it off to Peter to talk about kind of the future here. Thanks. So you know, this uh, David just described the state of metrics as it's existed for the in, you know largely the entirety of Kubernetes existing. C advisor gathering the metrics, you know, a cluster admin reading them through various methods and acting on them, and this works really well. But you know, we're constantly trying to improve Kubernetes and improve performance, and there's a couple of limitations that C advisor currently has that we want to address. So one limitation of it is it's a monolithic design. It's a very large piece of code. It's able to talk to a bunch of different container managers, you know, Docker, Container, D, and Cryo. 
but you know, because of that, it, it ends up being a little bit unwieldy to work with sometimes. It's also uh, barely CRI aware, even though you know, it's able to talk to you know, multiple CRI implementations, it uses uh, the C group hierarchy to guess, you know, to figure out what the container actually is, then you know, you know, makes a direct request to the CRI implementation to actually be able to get additional information from that. So it's kind of like an odd design you know, working to figure out what actually the container is up to. It also doesn't work at all for kernel separated containers, things like VMs made with Kata containers as well, as well as it doesn't work at all on Windows. And because of that, you know, there are new topologies of you know, Kubernetes nodes that are not even accessible to C advisor and you can't get all of the metrics that we're looking for. It's also, uh, there's some, there's some uh, work that's being duplicated between the CRI and uh, C advisor now. Kubelet has this notion of uh, the stats providers and there's a CRI and a C advisor stats provider. And when you use a CRI stats provider, it actually, uh, in addition to gathering the stats, the CRI, C advisor is continually gathering the stats because it's just watching, you know, the new C groups being created and it's, you know, just doing its thing, chugging along and reading all the values. But that creates duplicated work, which can actually have performance concerns, which is why, you know, Cryo doesn't even use a CRI stats provider, even though, you know, this, uh, it's a CRI implementation because we were worried about these performance uh, limitation. So, you know, we're looking, in thinking about the future, we, you know, are thinking about who should really own metrics collection. Z Advisor has been in this position for a long time and it has done a really good job of it. But, you know, as we're trying to improve, you know, and add more features and also uh, tune performance, you know, we also consider the CRI implementations as possibly being the best place to collect these because they're the ones closest to the containers and pods. And that's just what CAP 2371 does. It takes the CRI, the stats uh, gathering from C Advisor and pushes it to the CRI implementations. So here we have, you know, C Advisor list, CRI full container and pod stats CAP uh, 2371. And uh, in this CAP, we describe a world in which C Advisor is taken out of the business of gathering uh, container and pod stats. It still has some responsibility in the node, so it's not going away forever, but it is uh, having its capabilities reduced so that the entities that know best about the uh, containers and pods are the ones responsible for gathering those pods and containers stats. So here we have the alpha state of the CAP, which has uh, reached alpha in the last couple of releases. We have the, uh, these here are the, um, the CRI messages that the qubit will uh, request of the CRI to actually fulfill its needs for the stats and metrics. So we have the pod sandbox stats and that will feed into the stats summary API. So the stats summary API is, you know, has these uh, structured uh, fields that it needs to fulfill for the entities that are relying on it, like the uh, eviction manager. So the request is gonna, you know, ask exactly the things that it needs. We also have another structure, pod sandbox metrics. And for that structure, these are, you know, eventually gonna feed into the metric C advisor endpoint because, you know, they're just uh, key values basically on a, uh, you know, on the metrics themselves. So the CRI will do the gathering of the metrics in a similar way that C advisor does, report that up through the Kubelet, and then the Kubelet will report that through metric C advisor. Uh, so looking forward and imagining how the CRI stats will be exposed in the future, you know, the Kubelet will continue to expose those two endpoints. The metric C advisor endpoints will be based on the metrics object of the CRI. The Kubelet will request down to the CRI. CRI will gather all the information and report it back up to the Kubelet through the CRI. Um, and then the Kubelet will uh, convert those into Prometheus metrics will it, where it will emit it again over the metric C advisor endpoint, proxying it in a similar way as it did before for C advisor. Um, so the uh, endpoint won't change there. Uh, for the stat summary API, the, uh, the Qubit will request of the CRI implementation the stats object and you know the CRI will in similar fashion gather all the stats and then package them, send them up and then the Qubit will translate that into its stats summary object. From the stats summary, uh, API, the metrics resource uh, endpoint will also be fulfilled and that will be fed into, uh, you know, the eviction manager. The qubit will still depend on C advisor for gathering no level metrics because CRI, you know, even though it knows best about the individual containers, it may not know the best about how to gather the metrics on the full node. So we're still going to get machine stats from uh, C advisor and, you know, 
similarly, that will feed into the eviction manager, as we saw before. So what are we looking forward? You know, we've completed alpha, and then going forward towards beta, the main uh, priority that we have is testing. So we want to test a couple of different things. The accuracy of all of those metrics, believe it or not, you know, the, the, while the stats summary API is somewhat tested and we are validating the stats, we're actually doing little testing of the metric C advisor endpoint. And because of that, you know, we, to, uh, in the process of imagining you know, a place that it could be better gathered, we also want to make sure that the place that we're newly gathering it is uh, accurate. So we want to add additional testing to be able to test that as well as test the old implementation. We also do no uh, validation that all of the metrics exist on the node at all. C Advisor could technically right now just change any of those metrics and any of the alerts that exist on the system would be kind of uh, broken. So part of this is also adding uh, coverage to make sure that we have all of the metrics that you know people have begun to expect. It's functionally become a stable API of Kubernetes, even though we never made any promises about that. So we're going to you know, begin to make that promise. And then also testing the performance. I, metrics gathering is a really expensive thing that the Kubelet does, and the prospect of moving that into an entirely new component that hasn't been in this business for you know, the entirety of the time Kubernetes has existed uh, concerns some people, and you know, one might worry about the performance impact that might have. And it's an explicit goal of the KEP to make sure that there's no, there are no or very little performance uh, hit when we're uh, you know, making that change. And that'll also allow us to uh, test the performance of the existing implementation. So, you know, you as an end user might, you know, look up here and uh, hear all the things that we're talking about changing and might be worried, like, what am I going to see? Is, is my stats collection going to get messed up? And ideally, the answer would be none. Uh, the, you, there should be no impact to the uh, stats collection. Stat summary a, is a stable API of the Kubelet, and it's already being tested a little bit, and we're going to add some extra testing to make sure that those fields can be relied on, and eviction still works as we're expecting. The metric C advisor endpoint, even though none of those uh, Prometheus endpoints have been really tested, we're going to make sure that they get tested so that you, know, we, you can all rely on those uh, and not worry about that changing. In general, all of this extra testing should prevent regressions uh, so that you know, all, of the, all the metrics and all of the stats that you've been relying on won't get changed. In summary, uh, observability helps you gain insights into your application platform. You can use it to debug you know, an outage or like, you know, some app misbehaving, uh, as we saw earlier. C Advisor currently powers workload and container monitoring in Kubernetes. However, with CAP 2371, we're moving that from C Advisor into the CRI to better, uh, you know, have better performance and have a cluster that makes a little bit more sense. Um, as always, a contribution would be welcome if you have any interest in this work. You know, come chat to us in Signode. Uh, we're happy to you know, help you know, as we usher through um, into this new world. I'd like to thank everyone for joining us, as well as for you know, all of these communities here, Signode, C Advisor, Container Runtime Maintainers, and Run C Maintainers, all of which you know, are reliant on, uh, that the stats collection relies on, uh, and you know, they are vital components of the system. And uh, here are some more, uh, here are some more uh, resources that you could look into if you have any questions. And I believe we might also still have time for questions. So um, thank you, everyone, for joining. Do we have any uh, questions for us?